And we're going to talk about some futures. We're going to talk about some currencies. And we're going to talk about not just the current state of the market, but the strategies that right now I'm focused on to deal with what we're, what we're in right now, which is the end of the summer trading season. Uh, we'll talk about what that is anymore. And I think I can see the, all right, yeah, I can see if there's any questions you all have, let me know. We'll go ahead and tackle those. I love the interaction. So if you have a, a question, I'm, I'm here in my office and, and maybe a little bit later on, I'll turn the, uh, the camera around so you guys can just kind of uh, take a look at Trading HQ. But again, welcome to my office. It's been an interesting trading day, but I don't want to talk just about the near term. I want to talk a little bit more tactically about things that I've been doing here for for really since the beginning of June. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, first of all, let's talk about the overall big picture and we'll just sort of get more granular from there. The big picture of the market is what? We're still in an asset bubble gang and, and I wanna make this a little bit more near term a conversation as we go into September. And there's a few things to keep in mind as we wind down the month. First of all, we are still in a Fed inflated asset bubble. We do have Jackson Hole, the, what, the symposium this week. So uh, Jerome, as I like to call him, Kapowell, will be speaking. I think we'll see the typical rally into his speech, just like we would see a rally into an FOMC decision. So I, I definitely am looking at the markets, for the most part, strengthening, which is a bit at odds with the end of the month type behavior. So back in, it might have been 2014, don't hold me to the year, but there was uh, there were three Finnish researchers who did a study about the end of month sort of distribution outflows that we sort of just see as a typical phenomenon. And they basically said, look, the intensity of the distributions, meaning the weakness that we'd see in the markets as retirees say are cashing in some stocks and holdings in order to you know, pay themselves at the end of the month, uh, intensifies the last three days of the month and begins as far as eight days out. Well, we're in that window right now. So I'm not saying we just short the end of the month, but there is this tendency, right? That's all we're talking about, a tendency. So we, on one hand, we have uh, what could be an interesting rally into Jackson Hole, contrasting with this tendency to possibly sell off the last eight to most intensely the first three days of the month. The next thing is what happens when we get to September? I expect brand new inflows, gang. I don't think we're anywhere near this market deciding that high is high. We might see some rotation here and there. And, and what's rotation? Let's be honest. Rotation is some arbitrary level at which high beta, high momentum names, your tech names, your consumer discretionary, your communications. So let's, let's talk sectors, XLK, XLC, XLY, QQQ, and throw the SPY in there because it coattails the NASDAQ 100, the S&P ETF. When those reach some arbitrary level of having rallied too high, getting to levels that are too expensive, which is ridiculous to talk about in an uptrend. There's no such thing as overbought in an uptrend. But when we reach some arbitrary level, and don't be surprised if it accompanies end of month and a quarter, but we start to see this rotation into staples and we start to see a rotation into utilities and all of a sudden uh, financials and energies, which have absolutely been the dog of this market, are suddenly the popular kids in class. We'll see this momentary rotation. We'll probably see it again pretty soon. We saw it earlier this month. So for the most part, this market is what I call a double green market. Let's talk a little bit about technicals for a moment. When the eight exponential moving average is leading the way, followed by the 13, followed by the 21, and finally the 34, all Fibonacci number-based exponential moving averages. These are my secret squiggles. Everyone's got them, but I trust them. The probabilities accompanying that structure is very good when those exponential moving averages are lined up in that way. What we have is what I call a double green market. So I have a double green market. I have not only sentiment and momentum saying green, but I have the market trend also saying we're in an uptrend. In that kind of environment, I am forbidden. I will be grounded without dinner if I decide to pick a top. Realize this, and of course, me, like anyone else out there, you know, it's, it's not 
outside the realm of what I call the pig in the head to start to say, the market's gone too high. Let's pick a top. Let's buy puts. Let's put on some sort of short in a market that's in some cases parabolic, but at worst in a strong uptrend. Picking tops, call it contrarian, it is a revenge play. And humor me for a moment. This is psychology. If you are long a market, are you thinking about shorting it? Are you thinking about, gosh, this long is working so well, I can't wait to short this market? Of course not. You're thinking about, I hope this market goes to infinity and beyond. I hope it goes into buzz light year mode. That's the, sort of the generic, the general feel out there. I hope it just keeps going up forever. So realize that oftentimes top picking is a revenge play. Ask yourself if you only start top picking when you're out of long positions. Because if you're not out of long positions, you're just hoping these things continue to ride the wave. Like a great surfer, we never want the ride to end, right? So ask yourself, am I setting myself for a, re a revenge play, a revenge trade? So in a double green market, that structure that I described to you, the S&P is trading that way, the NASDAQ is trading that way, uh, consumer discretionary is trading that way, communications, XLK. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the difference between, say, QQQ, XLC, and XLK. And for those of you that either long-term term trade or even day trade, we'll talk about why this is important. So these ETFs have different weighting. They're all high concentration weighted ETFs, meaning a very small number of stocks comprises most of the weighting and the reason that they move. If you're a day trader, you love high concentration weighted sectors and indices, S&P, NASDAQ, Dow, and most ETFs that are popularly traded. So why is that great? Because you know that a very small number of stocks will move that sector. Oats and tide is the analogy that I've used throughout my career. If I, if I know the tide is going to be moving up, it's going to take the boats with it. That's typically the analogy. XLK is a concentration of Apple and Microsoft. I've been long XLK. I've been day trading XLK. Sometimes XLK is better than picking an individual stock within that ETF to day trade. XLC, that's Facebook, Goog, and Google. So you can see that the QQQs, your NASDAQ 100, where you've got Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, Google, um, who am I leaving out? Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Google. You can throw Tesla in there now, too. Um, they're, they're the top six, seven names, right? But when you go to XLK, it's an Apple, Microsoft story. When you go to XLC, it's a Facebook, Google story. When you go to XLY, that's 25% Amazon. So you can see those big names that are not only heavily weighted within the NASDAQ, but also the S&P are now divvied up in these sector ETFs. If you're day trading, which has been something I've been doing a lot of since late May, sometimes rather than playing the larger index, the QQQ, you notice that Certain stocks are relative outperformers. That's what us day traders live for. Even if you're thinking longer term overnight trend following, if you know certain segments of a broader index are outperforming and there's an ETF that will allow you to focus, to concentrate on those, we use those. It's, it's taking the relative performers out of the broader, broader index and, and really pedal to the metal, focusing on those. So we've talked about we're still in an asset bubble. Please don't pick a top. I have a sticky note, and I wish I could show it to you here. It's kind of off camera. Saying It reminds me, before I take a trade, do I hate my money? What do I mean by that? It's, it's meant to be a little bit of a pattern interrupt. But it's also here to remind me, if I'm somehow wanting to set up some bozo no-no trade, like picking a top in a very strong, if not parabolic, uptrend, because I'm out of longs, remember, am I setting up a revenge trade? Am I picking a top because I'm no longer long? And I want to remind myself, am I putting on a trade like that? And the double green, that structure of those exponential moving averages that we just talked about reminds me, don't do it, Rog. It's a lower probability play. Yes, eventually, like a broken clock, it will be right, right? But the higher probability play is just to be a surfer. You know, I live in South Florida. I've been, uh, I've been skipping class surfing since my junior year of high school. It served me well because now I'm a surfing trader. 
So a surfer never wants that ride to end, neither does a trend follower. When the signs become obvious, then we'll think about it. You know, when the waves start to lose momentum, when the trade starts to lose, the trend starts to lose momentum, I'll also lose interest in possibly that trade, but we're not there yet. You know, looking at these charts, we just punched up to new highs on the S&P. And I think that the sentiment that I've noted going into this weekend was probably as bearish as I've noticed in some time, meaning out there in trader land, out there in financial, you know, internet, financial Twitter, FinTwit as it's known, the, the increase in bearishness just continues to grow. Doesn't mean that we're not going to sell off at some point, but again, be a surfer. The wave's taken you, follow the wave. There's a reason I call one of my indicators the wave. It, it, again, it, it's another reminder. So uh, a few things just to kind of sum up where we're, where we're at so far. And I'm kind of throwing a little bit of a brain dump on you guys, but you know, I love these state of the markets. We can have this free flow kind of conversation. So one of the questions here is, does a dollar have more upside in the short term? I don't believe so. Now, let me, I'm just going to pull this up really real quick. Um, I love having the charts here in front of me. So the question is, does the dollar have, so I'm going to, I'm going to throw another question at you there. Underrated inventions. Anytime I might be, anytime I might be bullish or bearish dollar, here's a really good barometer. Here's a really good test. Do you have equal and opposite sentiment momentum trend in the Euro? Why is that? There are very few correlations in this market that are as 100% as a relationship between the Euro and the US dollar, almost tick for tick. By the way, that pair is the biggest market of any kind in all markets. It's the largest market in the trading galaxy, Euro versus US Forex. So in order to have a longer term expectation that the dollar is gonna break its downtrend, I have to also have a longer term expectation that the Euro is going to break its uptrend. I don't see that on the charts right now. When I look at the structure, and I'm going to pull this up just to make sure nothing crazy has happened. But, okay. So looking at that chart right now, yeah, no. In fact, in fact, I am thinking, and this is something that I've been eyeballing for the Forex Mastery that I do. I want to get short dollar again. I don't think that the dollar downtrend is done. It could bounce a little bit more, but let's remember that within the context of a downtrend, just like I don't want you picking tops in the uptrend in the, in the stock market, I don't want you picking a bottom. I mean, even think about that, picking a bottom. It doesn't even sound like something you should do in public. I don't want you picking a bottom in a downtrend, and the dollar is in a downtrend. So any bounce that it experiences right now is a retracement. It's a correction of an overall move lower. It's an opportunity so we know we know the buy the dip mantra, right? This is a sell the rip mantra. So yes, I want to sell the rip in the dollar. And I actually am looking at more downside in the dollar, specifically against the euro. And I believe, uh, let's see here. Yeah, so in my in my notes, I have against the euro, against the Australian dollar and against the pound. So if you're not a Forex trader, don't worry about it. You can look at the 6E, 6A, and 6B if you're a futures trader, or you could look at the FXE, the FXA, and the FXB if you're an ETF trader and play calls on pullbacks in each of those. Those would be long Euro, long Australian dollar, long British pound, short greenback, okay? So no, I'm actually, if we strengthen a little bit more in the dollar, terrific. It'll just rally a little bit more into a more conservative part of the zone for an overall short. So I, I wish it did, but I'd rather focus on the uh, on the short side. OK. All right. Uh, next up is and, and by the way, if you're interested in some of these types of trades, mostly in a shorter term time frame, but short term time frames can cascade into larger positions. This Thursday, I'll be doing a webinar, and I'm trying to get to hang on. Yeah, I'm doing a I'm doing a webinar this Thursday. In fact, if you look in the chat window, you can register for it Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern. 
I'm going to be walking through the uh, intraday trading that I've been doing, the day trading that I've been doing. And if you're interested in that, if you're interested in being nimble as we wind down August, if you're interested in being nimble, if you're one of those traders thinking, Ron, we're setting up for a potential significant pullback. I don't know that I want exposure to that overnight. Terrific. Shorten the time frame, become a day trader. Shorten your time horizon, stick to a day trading approach. So you can check out what I've been doing there. Um, so here's a great question. When do you think, and I, I think you guys can see the questions as I click on them here in the window. That's pretty cool. Uh, I, I think I missed this earlier. When do you think the market will sell off? QQQ is about 10% away from the 21 EMA. Look, I agree. The market is parabolic. Now, I want to refrain from assuming it's overbought or overextended or over anything. Here's what I know, and it's more... So sort, of, sort of sociology than it is technical analysis. Think about every pullback that we've seen in this market. Did it come when the chatter was at a fevered pitch about the pullback or did it come out of nowhere? The more and, and discounting, and there's a reason for this. It's the discounting mechanism of the market. You know, look, I could pull up charts and we could talk about, and this is just an inside joke in my office here. We could talk about secret squiggles and indicators all day long, but to understand the sociology, the psychology, the, the group think and then the individual think in the market, do, tr do corrections come when people are actively discounting for them? Remember, the market is a discounting mechanism. It's always taking what it believes it knows, individual market participants, and then we're making bets, replacing bets based on that. That's discounting. It's also just a trade matching machine. So the market's not out to get me. It's not out to hurt my feelings. It frankly doesn't even know I exist. The surfing analogy comes back. Gang, the surfer on the ocean, you think the Atlantic Ocean knows I'm out there trading, you know, trading, surfing a break off Jupiter? Not a clue, not a clue. For the most part, unless you're moving massive size, you know, unless you're a hedge fund, right? I don't know if there's any hedgies here. Um, <laughs> well, unless you're a massive, you're moving a lot of size, the market doesn't even know you're there. And there's an advantage to that. I say that because we're all expecting certain kinds of moves. And if we're all expecting a move lower, it's been discounted. It's been priced into the market. And the very fact that we're all talking about it, it could be any kind of news. The very fact that we're talking about it probably means it's priced in. So that's why I say that if we're looking at some sort of sell-off, the precursor to that is not going to be you and I talking about it. That's my that's my feeling about that. So line watcher, terrific question. Um, 10%, 11%, 12%, it's arbitrary. I don't think we reach some sort of threshold like a bungee jump where we snap back. But if we were, if we were, you know what? I'm going to look at something else here. If we were, this is how I would measure this. Okay. And if you like some of these types of you know, in terms of the different tools I'm going to talk about here, you'll dig the conversation on Thursday. So definitely register for that. But if there is a likelihood for any kind of exhaustion, I'm going to base it on volume. I'm going to look at a standard deviation of volume weighted average price. I'm not just going to look at price because one contract could go off at a high. A thousand and one contracts could go off at a high. The size matters. And if we are reaching some sort of high. And it's interesting that you ask. And look at the S&P right now. I'll look at the Qs next. We're at the lower end of a larger zone that could be now showing that we've reached a possibly a threshold, possibly a level from which it's it's actually two standard deviations away from the mean, above the mean, where we're starting because we could reach almost three standard deviations above the mean. Uh, before we pull back. So we're in the lower end of a resistance zone on the S&P daily and on the NAS. So on the NASDAQ, we could go as high as, looks like three, I'm gonna get the, get the number, I wanna make sure I get this number right for y'all. But almost a plus three standard deviation, almost three standard deviations above the mean 
in terms of the volume weighted average price. So this is a V-score tool that I created for myself to understand if a market's sort of gone too far away from uh, the mean from a volume perspective. And we're not quite there yet. So I'll give you the specific readings. We're at a 259 reading, and I think that the top is a 286. 2.86, almost three standard deviations. We're at 2.59. So are we getting close? There's a good argument for that. There's a, there's a solid argument for that. That we're not there yet, but if we are going to reach some sort of level using a tool that has, it has, by the way, has reaching that level before created this snapback in the market? No, it actually hasn't. So you might say, Rob, does that mean if we reach 286 on your V-score, we're going to snap back? It does not. It just means that we're at a level at which the market might slow its rally. That's all. So I want to refrain from wanting to participate in the pullback and instead hoping those top pickers are right. They've been wrong for April, May, June, July, August, right? It's a low probability play. I'm rooting for them though, okay? I hope they create, I hope they get some traction because that's where we will not pick a top, but it goes right back to let's buy a dip. Those short sellers are going to create the dip for us. I'm grateful for them. I hope they get that pullback. I'm not rooting against them at all. I just think they're on the lower probability side of the market that's moving higher. They're, they're traders that are running up the down escalator, right? That's the way I look at it. So, um, you know, if the overall market's still a double green, the structure we talked about earlier, let's stick with that. And let's, let's root for those pullback traders, meaning those people that are picking a top, let's root for them, but let's not participate with them. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of take advantage of the move that they create for, a, I think, a higher probability play. All right. So, hey there, Candy. How are you? How are you? Uh, next up is, uh, took off a Tesla and a Facebook trade for a profit. Congrats. A couple's playbook. Excellent. Um, you know, Tesla has been a very popular name here at Simpler. John has been, for, you know, some of you might have been following some of the emails we've been sending out. Uh, that's been a great trade for John and uh, for a lot of us here. If, for those of you that might be saying, what's Tesla have to do with, say, a futures trader? Realize now that Tesla is the number seven weighted name, sometimes eight kind of goes back and forth, but it's a heavily weighted name within the NASDAQ now. So futures traders should keep an eye on that. So you're still long a little bit Apple, as am I, Amazon. Uh, ditto and Adobe, getting a little nervous. Uh, well, so Apple, I wouldn't get too nervous about for now. I think until the split happens, you're probably going to see uh, folks still willing to buy Apple. And look, here's another thing to bring up. The way in which you engage a trend is going to dictate your tolerance for a pullback. So if you're buying higher highs, if you're buying into momentum, if you're buying as a stock or a futures contract or whatever, breaks a threshold through resistance, your ability to sit through a pullback is going to be really pretty small, pretty low, because you've bought at a high, which as a momentum trader with a strategy, maybe a volume breakout strategy, it's probably worked really, really well. But just remember the flip side of that is when the market pulls back, it's it's going to hurt because A, you bought, not you, but in general, um, someone has bought options with bullish momentum in a parabolic uptrend. You bought an expensive option. I bought an expensive, if we've done that, it's a very expensive option. It doesn't give us a lot of latitude to be wrong. The way that I've dealt that with that throughout my career is know your pitch. For me, I ha I have a mantra. Up trends correct. Healthy uptrends correct. They may not correct often. They may not correct with the frequency I wish they would, but most of them do. There's going to be some ability to take advantage of a slight correction or a flattening of the market, which then reduces implied volatility, giving us an opportunity to buy options at a little bit less of a December 24th toy price. You know what I'm saying? You don't want that frenzy built into the option price that you're you're entering. And you might say, well, Rob, what if I do a vertical spread? 
one leg of your entry is still going to be obscenely overpriced, you know, even if you're able to offset the cost or loss by completing, say, a call over, over a call vertical. So be vigilant about those flat days, those inside days, those pullback days. Be vigilant about getting three down days in a row. There are patterns that I look at as a day trader to determine my directional bias. And I also look at it as a overnight daily trend, daily time frame trend following swing trader. And, and those are patterns that I'll try to take advantage of. So they may not be ideal. I may not get, you know, 50% or a 618 retracement that I would love to see of the last major move in a parabolic market. It's unrealistic. Am I going to get a pullback to a 21 EMA or 13? Gosh, I'm lucky to get a pullback to an eight in a parabolic market. But I will shift strategies. Once a market's gone parabolic, which is typically two daily price movements, price movement ranges away from the 34 EMA. So how do I gauge parabolic? I don't use a parabolic tool. What I say is I look back at historical volatility. I look at the daily historical volatility. And when we're 2x that from the 34 period on the close, were parabolic and I will shift to much more aggressive pullback strategies. Having said that, if you even wait for a shallow pullback, your tolerance for flat days, pullback days is going to be so much better, so much better. Um, be selective about those dips that you buy. And, and for me, I almost never buy new highs in a double green uptrend because I'm very susceptible to greater fool theory. Now, are there exceptions to that? Yes, what I like to see, and, and some of you are probably going to be familiar with the strategy, and that is I'll wait for a squeeze, and then what I'll, what I'll do is called a squeeze retreat. I'll wait for the squeeze to fire, and I'll wait for a quick retracement. So I know that there's an initial push of momentum. Sometimes I won't get that retracement. Most of the time I will. So I'll take advantage of that quick move to the downside after the initial frenzy to get long, and I'll grab the trend. So... And it should be volume confirmed, right? Volume confirmed breakouts have a higher probability of follow through even after a slight retreat, okay? Now, the same thing's gonna work for, for day trading, right? I will look at these end of day patterns and they will set up my day trades as well. So for a lot of traders, especially in parabolic markets, those markets that have gone parabolic on the daily are gonna be some of the best markets that you can focus on as an intraday day trader. So in some, environments, especially near these very tippy, tippy top highs, I'm not willing to buy up there, but I'll day trade it. I'll get some fluctuation in today where I can find a nice trough to enter long and I'll just day trade it. I'll get flat. I'll sleep well at night and I'll just do it all over again the very next day. So does that make sense? Okay. I mean, these are strategies that you can use. These are strategies that are very, uh, I think, pretty, pretty basic in terms of lending themselves well to longer term entries, especially for options traders, and then also lending themselves really well to watch list building for intraday trades. So uh, that's that's one of the tactics that I like to use. Uh, next up is, hey there, Al. I noticed lately that FXY's volume has been decreasing. Please comment as to what that means. So it's August. I think mostly it means it's August. Now, think about this. If you're in FXY, you're actually playing U.S. dollar versus Japanese yen. That's what that position actually is. U.S. dollar versus Japanese yen. So if the stock market is up, generally speaking, we talked about the parabolic nature of the stock market. It would go to say that the yen is, generally speaking, pretty weak. So... If the dollar's in a downtrend and is also weak, if the yen is also weak because of the risk appetite inequities, you've got weakness versus weakness. Now remember, the market is a competitive place. In each, each symbol is almost competing for attention. If I've got better currency contrast in the uptrend in the Euro US, the uptrend in the pound versus US dollar, and the downtrend in the dollar Canada, as well as the uptrend in the Aussie versus US. In other words, buy euro, buy pound, buy Aussie, buy loony against the greenback. The dollar yen all of a sudden doesn't sound so interesting. It's not garnering as much attention 
because there are better currency contrasts out there. There are, there are better other currencies to be long versus the US dollar. So when you're pairs trading, there's always that contrast to be considered. So I don't think it's that the yen is signaling anything in, in particular. I think partly it's the end of August and partly why be long or short yen against the dollar if I have got much better trends in the euro, pound, Aussie, et cetera. Does that make sense? So I think it's just losing out in a bit of a, a bit of a beauty pageant, if you will. That's the way I look at that. All right. Uh, I hope that I hope that makes sense. Um, so as far as uh, as far as my course coming up, sure. Some of you might have seen the email. Uh, again, I've been day trading because, and this is going to sound a little flip, but I mean it. When I am in an environment where the markets are at these up on their tippy toes and it's uncomfortable to be long, say Apple, right up at the ties, um, Tesla, Amazon. One of the things that's much easier is to be a day trader and be able to say, and I love this, think about this, think of the freedom of going, who cares? Is this market gonna keep going? As long as it goes higher for that session, as long as it moves higher for the first two hours or maybe the first, you know, that day's trading action, that's all I care. What happens tomorrow, who cares? It's freeing. Every morning I get to start off with a brand new watch list if I've seen some some patterns that I like to see emerge and I get to start all over again. And it's very freeing because that means that my exposure to some sort of massive pullback that the market seems to be waiting on quite eagerly, I'm not going to really ex be exposed to a three, four percent sell off. I might take a small hit. I'll get stopped out as a day trader, but I'm not going to take that big ride lower. And in the meanwhile, every morning, especially in parabolic markets, I'll take as much of that, that day's strength as I can take advantage of, take a piece of it, you know, just take a piece of it, not the whole thing. I may not get the appetizer, I may not get dessert, but I'll get the I'll get a meal and I'll get out. That nimble type of trading is very freeing during summer, during the last two weeks of August, during a time where markets are parabolic and trading at their highs. Uh, I can do this with options, I can do this with futures, I can do this with ETFs. And, and that really is the bulk of what I'm doing right now. Does that take away my end of day trend following, you know, daily time frames? It really doesn't. But what it means is if you can compartmentalize, and this is what I do, first two hours of the day, 9.30 to 11.30, I'm day trading. I literally get up out of my office, and I don't know if I can, I'm not going to swivel this around, but I'll get out of the office here, walk out the door that's sitting right behind this camera, and I will go do something almost to reset my mind to come back into this very office, sit in this very chair and say, now I'm going to look for end of day charts and trend following. I'm done day trading. I put it on my trade management. I'll look for patterns that might set up for a late day rally. But for the most part, I'm done. Now I'm going to focus on daily time frames and I'm not looking at the one minute anymore. When you can compartmentalize, now you can take advantage of different strategies. I think most traders struggle when they try to do everything at once. I used to do that. Epic failure. It's too hard. It's unenjoyable. I miss trades. One thing at a time. It's true. Multitasking does not work. So that's really what the class is all about. It's, it's I know it's going to sound funny, but it's sort of like, how freeing is it to say, who cares? How freeing is it to just get in the market for two hours, make some decisions about what's going to happen that day, and then do it again the next day. If and when we get a really big pullback, we get that pullback everyone's waiting for, like we talked about before, some massive three, four, five, six, seven percent pullback, whatever it is. Then I can, in the second half of my day, again, I've compartmentalized, right? In the second half of my day, I can look at those trends and say, finally, here we are at the 21 exponential or the 34, or finally we've made a 50% retracement or a 618. And I want to buy calls and I want to get long because I'm going to buy the dip. So, so those are the kind of things that I like to take advantage of. I hope that makes sense, but you can only do that when you compartmentalize. And here's the other cool thing. We like to be active. We like to do stuff. I mean, we're human. That's the way it is. If I don't have opportunity on the daily time frame, my day trading, my one minute time frame is going to give me some things to do. Constructive, hopefully profitable, productive, 
uh, risk controlled things to do. And when I don't have any day trading, because I'm, again, I'm wearing a completely different hat, uh, which I probably should wear because I keep giving myself quarantine haircuts. Um, when I'm wearing a different hat, if the day trading wasn't yielding anything for me to do, possibly there are some call options, some vertical spreads, some pullback buys that I could take advantage of end of day. And that's what I do. Uh, probably the last one that I did was, was Home Depot. Home Depot. So when you can do that, you're not going to force trades. You're not going to force day trades and you're not going to force end of day trades. And, and that to me is a really huge part of why I love the day trade, not to mention the understanding of momentum. My end of day entries are far better because I've got this granular understanding of momentum and, and lows and highs and how to position myself uh, because I day trade. So, all right. Um, do I think GLD will break 1900 short term? Well, I, I won't. So, so, so Flora, the question about gold, cool question. Uh, I long gold. I, I can't be sure. Gold is a play on real yields. Real yields are chopping around right now, but I do believe they'll resume their downtrend and gold will resume its uptrend. My zone, my conservative zone on GC, the December contract of gold, is 1920 to 1903 with a stop loss just below 1900, the major psychological level. That means as long as GCZ, the December contract of gold, is trading above 1900, I'm feeling pretty good about being long GLD, which I am, and I'm long GC too. So do I think it's going to break 1900? Well, if it does, I'm still going to be looking long because on the 12th, we had that low down at, what was it, 60, no, sorry, 74. So even heading down to 74, 1874, would simply represent a trend break, which we've already seen, and an oversold buy. So 1900 isn't the end-all, be-all for me, although it's a major psychological level, and I hope it holds. But, but 1874, which we saw on the 12th of August, probably will be a level to watch. What I'll do to confirm that in the coming days is look at volume. I'll look at where we are in a point of control. I'll look at where we are in a value area low. And if there's anything that I can encourage folks to do is find the price-based indicators that you like, but find some volume-based indicators where you can confirm price. Conviction at certain levels, the size at certain levels, is going to give you a lot of insight into whether those levels can hold. Okay, I'll take a few more questions and we'll wrap it up here. Mm, I'm working a small account. Hey there, Chris, I'm working a small account. Do I trade the micros or some of the new futures products on the small exchange? So this is what I call choose your own adventure, my friend. I look at the S&P ES contract, for example, and I'll trade the ES. But the ES, this is the cool part, the ES will also fire off opportunities in the SPY options, in the micros, and even in heavily weighted sectors and stocks that, that are basically tethered to, connected to, sympathetic with the S&P movement. So you get to decide, and, and usually it's going to be based on account size, it's going to be based on risk tolerances. You get to, to decide the vehicle with which you're going to take that drive with me. Some folks, we're all going to drive that same path. We're all on that same route, right? We're all on that same street, however you want to look at it. But some folks are driving SPY options. Some folks are in micro ES. Some folks are in ES futures. Uh, some folks have decided that if, for example, Apple and Microsoft are outperforming that day, they'll take it on XLK. Uh, if whatever sector might be outperforming the broader index, they might decide that, but we're all actually taking the same route. That's the choose your own adventure part of it. So if you're working with a small account, there's a couple of choices you have. One, go with options, go with micros. Or, you know, for a lot of traders, you're comfortable with the ES, but the initial margin requirement is, is prohibitive. You know, even at 25% initial margin requirement, it's it's that's a that's a lot. It's a it's a it's a big number. So there are certain brokerages, and I'll talk about them on Thursday, and there are certain alternatives that you can use to use less margin, and doesn't mean that the risk is less. You know, I love that you're thinking about risk, 
but it doesn't mean that the risk is less, but you can make the trade affordable. Really, that's what we're talking about here. You can make the trade affordable. All right. Uh, let's see. Let me tackle another question, and then we'll call it a day. Uh, let me see here. And thank you so much for joining me for our state of the market. How are you guys doing? Is this is this uh, helpful? Um, you know, maybe opening up some new ideas for you. Maybe different paths where you thought you were limited on what you could do, but in reality, you know, you're just going to think outside the box a little bit. You know. Um, and if you see those parabolic markets that you want to engage, but you're uncomfortable doing so overnight, shorten the time frame. Think like a day trader. Get nimble. Take that wonderful who cares attitude. Sleep well at night. Sleep is important, don't you know? And then just engage the market at these highs, these parabolic highs, by just getting in, getting out, getting flat. You know, day trading was the very first type of trading. When Wall Street was literally a field next to a big wall, everyone went home flat every day. There were no overnight positions when Wall Street was that field next to the wall. So, and the kind of day, the kind of trading they did was day trading. Uh, day trading only means it's not tactical on the. It, it doesn't describe the way you enter the market. It's only describing the way you're going to exit it. How we day trade, a whole bunch of different strategies we can all use. But the one thing that all day traders agree on is yes, we're all going to be flat by the end of whatever that session is for us. All right, very cool, very cool. Um, should you take the futures course before the? Uh, you don't have to, Avi. No. So the question is, do you need to be fluent in futures before you take this class? Uh, the one thing I'm going to talk about on Thursday is the fact that you don't need to trade futures at all if you don't want to. The day trading class is about futures and options. It's about futures. It's about sectors that are heavily weighted within the futures and stocks that are heavily weighted within the sectors and the indices. So it's it's really, uh, my approach is index, sector, stock. So if you wanna trade options, I'm gonna talk about day trading options this Thursday. If you wanna trade futures, absolutely. Do you need to know about futures? I mean, look, if you, if you know the point value, if you know the potential risk and the historical volatility, meaning, you know how much they can move. Therefore, you've got a pretty good idea, a pretty good measuring stick for risk. Beyond that, do you need to memorize notional values and have some sort of encyclopedic information about this knowledge about futures? No, I mean, as long as you know first notice date, as long as you understand volatility, you can calculate risk based on $50 a point or $20 a point or whatever it is. So you know how you can scale in and scale out. Uh, anything else I'll, I'll teach you in terms of risk. And, and I am very conservative in my trading, very conservative. Uh, I hate to lose. I'm an awful loser. Uh, many of you who've been in the chat room when I've lost, it, it, it unsettles me. doesn't mean that it's a bad habit. I just feel that when I put a high probability trade on, I'm disappointed when I lose. I put my stop loss in. I accept it. But I'm a little bit of a sore loser, a um, little bit. I'm not proud of it. I'm not proud of it. Luckily, it's not something I have to experience very often. Maybe that's why I'm a sore loser. So I don't like to lose. So my trading plans are very much oriented to I'd rather miss a trade than take one that I wish I wasn't in. That's my, my tendency. I'd rather miss a trade than take one I wish I wasn't in. Let's use a baseball analogy. I'd rather let that pitch go by if it wasn't my pitch than take a wild swing at it. That's not my style. So I just like boring chop markets. Yeah, I'm with you. But there's always something to do if you're nimble with your time frame. You know, if it's chop on the daily, inside the daily, you've got one minute time frames that might give you entries and follow through. You just have to shorten the time frame. Again, that's why I love the day trading. Losing does not tickle. I'm with you, Al. Very true. Very true. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, I'm super stoked for the class. It's the first time I'm really revealing uh, everything that I do on options day trading as well as my futures. And I've never done the options day trading portion publicly before. So, no, you don't need any precursor. No, I'll be going through some of the basics. Again, I don't think you need this encyclopedic kitchen sink type approach to 
futures or to anything to trade it, you just need to be able to manage your risk. And risk means understanding expiration dates and point values and, and volatility events and things like that. All right. Um, okay, cool. Oh, when is the class? The class is this Saturday, August the 29th at 1 p.m. Eastern. Join me on Thursday. I want you to get a really good idea of what it is that I'm doing and, and the kind of trades that I'm taking. I want it to be a match for you, gang. I want it to be something that you can really benefit from. So definitely join me on Thursday. But the class is on Saturday, August 29th, this Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Totally stoked to share this with you. But you can catch the previous replay. I believe it's simplertrading.com forward slash pattern. And you can register for the new and you can register for the class at simplertrading.com forward slash gains. G-A-I-N-S. And again, you can watch the previous webinar on futures at simplertrading.com forward slash pattern. P-A-T-T-E-R-N. All right. So, gang, let me wrap it up here. Um, it's been an interesting day. Let's see. I, I don't know that I can actually kind of show you my office here. Can I, is, it, is it coming through? I haven't even cleaned off my desk. It's still probably pretty much a disaster. Uh, so welcome to my uh, welcome to my office. <laughs> okay, gang. Um, have a uh, have a great one. Thank you as always for joining me, and thank you for being a part of the Simpler Trading community. And I look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Uh, if you're there on Thursday, give me a shout out. Say, hey, Rob, I saw you on the state of the market on uh, Monday. And if I see you on Saturday, terrific. There's a tech session that will be uh, happening before that class to get you all set up with the indicators that I use. And I think that's about it. Any thoughts on order flow? James, I do, but golly, I mean, that could be a, an hour long uh, discussion. Order flow, yes. I mean, it, it, I think to me, it, in terms of order flow, uh, the discussion's got to be time and volume. Time and volume. I mean, you say order flow, and the first two words I come up with are time and volume. So, yes, I think <clears throat> by harnessing an understanding of time and volume, you can better decode what uh, order flow is telling us about what the markets are doing. All right. All right, gang. Thank you as always. I really appreciate all. You Gosh, I, I love the, uh, thank you very much for the time and the questions. Really, really great. Yeah, don't crack the screen, exactly. Um, thank you so much for the time. And, and this is, this is um, some of you might know, my husband trades with me as well. And he's not here right now, because clearly that's his, that's his desk back there. Those are his four monitors. And then uh, what I've got here, sorry for the earthquake type. And I've got the nine here. And then, uh, oh, I got to brag on my mom's painting. My mom painted that for me. So uh, got that there. Yep. And uh, so, yeah, welcome to the desk. Welcome to the, uh, I, I just, oh, see, this is when I just start getting a little crazy. I just watched a great Netflix documentary uh, called um, Speed Cubing or Speed Cubers. It's on Netflix. It was really, really good. And um, I, I got my old uh, Rubik's Cube. It's like Go Cube off the shelf. Gang, this is actually a really good analogy for trading. The best cuber in the world, the best speed cuber, three by three speed cuber in the world is working for a financial company in Australia. What do we do as traders? We recognize patterns. That's what we do. And I, don't, I never knew why I loved the Rubik's Cube. And then when I watched it, I'm like, of course, we watch patterns. And that's what I teach. That's what I do. Pro high probability patterns, repeating patterns. And I guess a Rubik's Cube is a really good analogy for that. So whether it's a one minute chart, whether it's a daily time frame, we're recognizing those patterns and we're solving the problem. And uh, yeah, so Rubik's Cube on the desk here. <laughs> okay, gang. Have a great one. Thanks as always for your time. Be good to each other. I'll see you in the next, uh, well, state of the market. Okay. Take care, gang.